Welcome, welcome. I'm Christian. Welcome to my humble channel, Lazy Devs Academy, and welcome. Well, I've been long for a very, very long time. We're gonna talk about this at the end of this video where we do the housekeeping. Today, I wanted to jump straight into our topic. We are going to look at a new Pico 8 version. <gasps> the, yes, this is right. If you look exactly, let me, oh, no, wrong finger. There we go. There, if you look exactly what's written there, you will see there's 0 0.1. Point one two C. This is the new version of Pico 8 that just came out. I'm gonna because hmm, look at this. We have a whole um, whole post by Zep from Lex Lothel who made like who released this version, who is the creator of, of Pico 8, and he kind of like um, walks us through some of the features. I want to look at some of the features myself. I'm gonna pick uh, some of the stuff that I really enjoy. I'm gonna test it out with you guys. I'm gonna discuss it a little bit, and uh, I'm gonna also look a little bit in the change log to see maybe if there is some additional stuff that is actually worth discussing, work talking about. Cool, cool. This is exciting to me. There has been there hasn't been a Pico 8 version uh, in a long time, and I notice I've been always in the past. I've been skipping over the updates. I'm like, okay, whatever. I'm just gonna like get the gist, general gist, and then move on. And then I realize later on down the line, you notice maybe in um, the rogue -like tutorial that I completely uh, missed important changes to the way Pico 8 work. So this time I want to do it right. I want to actually look closely at what is happening. And the biggest change off the bat. It's blue now. Everything is blue. Um, so there has been a change, a little bit of the background. Previously it was like this dark gray. It was, I think this was the background previously. Now it's a dark blue. This is technically not a new thing to Pico 8. This um, option to choose a different background color was pre um, there previously already. That was kind of like a special version for people who might, be, um, might not be able to recognize colors perfectly. And um, and but it was always like this kind of like special option, you know. Um, but uh, in this version, it, it, they changed it to being the default color scheme. I appreciate this a lot. I really like it a lot. I also well, I always want to use this other color scheme. It has more contrast. Here you can uh, read the text more clearly. I always wanted to use this version, but I decided not to because I didn't want to people um, for people to get confused or unsure about what's happening if their Pico 8 looks different from my Pico 8. Like I always wanted to uh, all my tutorials or of my manuals guides to be something that works, you know, that just like works all, um, out of the box. So I'm glad uh, the default has changed now really good stuff. Need to get used to it myself a little bit, but I appreciate it. Now moving on, there's some uh, additional um, color short, um, color <laughs> keyboard shortcuts that I really enjoy. Um, so let me see. We have control B. Let's test that. So test, test, test. And with, with it, mark this, I think this should be, yep. Control B allows you to comment out a large piece of code. Uh, let me let me load something. Um, let me load some random. Let's see uh, some random. Um, oh, this is also by the way. This is also something new. Uh, if you load something and you there is like potential to destroy some code, there is actually it asks you if you want to overwrite, if you want to discard the code that you've written. Really good stuff. This is some code I written so, some time ago. So now if I want to comment something out, you can go control B and the whole code will be commented out and you can comment it back in. Now, by the way, this is actually different from the way I think uh, you can also use commenting. There was like, was it slash or star? Oh no, it was these guys. You could always comment a big chunk of code this way with the double square brackets, but I never liked that too much um, because it's kind of like odd. You would have to also check where it ends, where it begins and ends, stuff like that. Stuff like that. And so I'm glad there's a shortcut for this now. Really good stuff. There's also another shortcut. Control W puts you at the beginning of a line. Control E puts you at the end of the line. W and E are next to each other. So maybe that's how you can like remember this. So this allows you to navigate with a cursor more uh, rapidly. Obviously on Windows you also have like 
I have the German keyboard, so it says pause one and end. So there's like dedicated keys for this, but I think in different um, development environments, I think on a Mac, you might not even have the dedicated keys for that on your keyboard. So in this case, control W and control E allows you to do that. Great stuff. Now there's a new function which I really really like, which is the way search works has been a bit expanded. You see, the way search worked previously is you was you could only search the given tab. So for example, let's see I have first frame or um, let's go update start, right? Hmm, maybe not this one. Let me pick something that I'm pretty sure is in here. Okay, let me let me let me look for function newt box, right? This is a function that I want to look for. Okay, I'm gonna go to tab one, look for function newt box, right? Control F was to search, and it doesn't find it. It didn't re return a result. It does return a result if I do it in this tab. It didn't. The search function didn't go across tabs. It just searched in this one tab. So if I go way four, you will see it will find instances. By the way, also another little detail, mm, something I really love. While you're searching, it will actually highlight the you know, occurrences of a given word. So when you see way four, and way four was highlighted here because it found instances of this. This is so good. So you can kind of like give you get get feedback of where st stuff is while you're searching for it. You know what would make my game my day really like mm, if you select a, a word if that would also highlight you know copies of the selected word. But mm, you know let's get get uh, get ahead of ourselves. Okay, so um, so in function newt box didn't result didn't return result. Now you can press Control H and it will uh, repeat the search across all of the tabs. So um, function H was kind of like similar to the um, control H was is a little similar to the control G work before. So you will see if I search for something like way and I, I search for it, it will return at the first instance of it. If I want to have the second, I would do control, um, control G and it will you know, con repeat the search, but return the second, third, and so forth. It will continue doing the search all the way down. But now with Control H, it, it does so. It does the same thing, but across the tab. So you will see now me skipping through the, all of the instances of the word "way" across all of the tabs in the program. This is generally how it works. Really great if you're not really sure where your stuff is, or if you want to find. You know, for example, you call a function. I'm not sure really sure in which of the tabs you define the function. You just search for the name of that function and you might find the definition easier. Love it. Good stuff. Okay, the next one is going to be a bit difficult. The next one is about the blue dots. Let me load up uh, maybe something that will exemplify the blue dots. Okay, so I this is a small mock-up, but mm, you will see. So we have a um, very simple empty uh, program with a bunch of colored Tiles. So we have like this tile, this is the standard um, map tile that we already discussed in the roguelike tutorial. This map tile um, renders, uh, this tile renders on the map as black. So the, you see the cross here, but if I pick this and start drawing it, it won't show up at all because this is tile number zero and tile number zero renders as black and transparent on the map. Easy. So I'm gonna draw my, let's say, oops, I didn't want to do that. Uh, uh, let me draw a rectangle out of these red tiles here, right? So we have red tiles. So let's say inside, I'm gonna pick a different tile that is not the first tile, it's a different tile that is completely black. And let's say I'm gonna fill this with this, this red rectangle with those black, completely black tiles. You will see it will in the editor, but not in the game, you will see a blue dot there. The blue dot indicates that this tile is completely black, but it there is a tile there potentially there that would that is just painted black, but it's not the tile that is the empty tile. That is kind of like to differentiate the empty tile and tiles that are completely black but are not the empty tile. 
that's a li little little convenience here because most people who used those bl black tiles would then have to like during development they would have to like somehow mark them because it was important with a dot or something let's say let's let's mark them with a yellow dot for example so now we have like a yellow square here so you can tell which tiles have been painted black and which tiles are actually um, uh, empty but now the program does it automatically it recognizes which tile is completely black and will give you this little help this little hint in in the editor those won't show up uh, in the game however it's just like something for you if you work a lot with a map editor i guess this is a huge help now we have been dancing around the bush beating around the bush <laughs> We've been avoiding the big one for a while, but now let's discuss this. We have finally include. How does include work? Let me set up a small test stand for us, okay? Okay, let's, for the sake of argument, assume that we start from scratch from an empty file like this. We can now, with the include statement, we can take some other file that we have, some other code, and kind of like paste it in here but not like in a copy and paste kind of way, but it will get automatically pasted in when we run the code. So it's not pasted until we run it. So let me show you, for example, something. I'm gonna write a magical thing here. I'm gonna go hashtag include test.txt. Test.txt is a file that exists in the same folder. I just included that file into it. So it, now it's technically, although it's a different file, it's part of this code. And if I run this though, even though there is no, no other code here whatsoever, I'm gonna run this and it seem, you can tell it does something. That's because all of the code, all of the, and there's an init function inside the test txt function. I'm gonna show it to you right now. Whoop, there we go. So this is the test txt function. Let me zoom in a little bit. And as you can see, it's standard Lua code, it's standard Pico 8 code, it's an init function that all does all this stuff. But the trick is now that um, this whole code is kind of like um, exported or um, outsourced into a different file that can sit somewhere on my PC and it's not part of you know the file that I'm editing when I'm doing um, when I'm working here in Pico 8. Hmm. So why, why are we having this? Well, there's multiple ways of, in, in which this helps us. I think there's like two very important things. One is that when you are working with external editors, um, you kind of like always lost something here. And the most important thing that you lost, I think, was the, the inability to work with tabs. In Pico 8, we, we have those beautiful tabs that we can open up so we can structure our code. So, you know, all of the stuff that belongs to one part is in one tab and all of the stuff that belongs to the other part is in another tab. If you open the, um, the game, the program that you're working on, a Pico 8 file in a text editor, all of your code would appear in just one big file and there was no way of you structuring your code anymore. Now with include, you can structure your code. So for example, here I'm using, just so for clarity's sake, I'm using um, a Notepad++. And so for example, I have like this init function here in my one tab, that's test.txt. And then my, I might have like the draw and update function, another tab that's, that's game stuff.txt. And I can actually go in here, let me go back in here. Uh, and I'm gonna include both of these in here, oops include game stuff and test txt and if I save this and run this you will see I will have a little game happening here and so but I can now edit like work on this program in in my external text editor uh, and having like a more you know more screen resolution more screen real estate uh, my own syntax highlighting you know the all the comparable tools of an external editor um, you don't aren't like confined to this little pixelated window here that we had before a lot of people enjoy this kind of way of work in pico 8 and so now you have more tools at your hand at your disposal um, to 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 um, to facilitate this this way of working one thing that we should keep in mind is that this is not a trick or, or a uh, tool to get around the token count. So you will see, I'm gonna comment this out. I'm gonna save it. And if I type info, you will see it has zero tokens. But if I bring these guys back and save it and type info now, 
you will see 76 tokens. So uh, when I save it or when I export the program, all of the files that I included are pasted in here and they will count towards the token count. So there's still a bit of an issue when working with silent editors where you're not really aware of how many tokens you use unless you go in here and you type in info to see how many tokens you used, okay? Um, there is another cool thing that you can use with include, which is you can build up your own libraries of things of functions that you use quite often. And so, for example, you might remember if you watched a pork like tutorial, I had like a tab that was tab number three, and that had like all those cool functions, for example, drawing text with outlines. That was cool. You could do that. And so, um, so yeah, you can actually now create like, like a text file or something that has all your favorite function that you use over and over again for every program. And you can just, instead of like copying and pasting it every time, you can just include it and bam, it works. Um, and so you can even, and that's something that I found really, really hot. You can even include other Pico8 files and even include specific tabs from other Pico8 files. So here's an example of how that works. So now I included pork p8, that is a file in the same folder, um, and, but the uh, colon three means that it included only the tab number three from my pork p8 file. So if I run this now, not much happens, but now at my, I, have my, I have at my disposal, um, I can use the functions from that tool. So for example, let me just for a second copy in the text, the, the code from test.txt. Um, so I can use this function called opprint, for example, now. Uh, I that was kind of like part of the code that is in pork p8, in the tab three of pork p8. And this allows me to um, draw something like this. Uh, it's called opprint8. There we go. So I can now use functions that are not in my code, but somewhere else, kind of like a library of functions that I often use. I can now outsource them and they can be somewhere, I can write them once and they can be optimized and everything. And they're not getting in the way of, of the program I'm working on currently. Cool stuff. Now there's a bit of a caveat. I've been doing some testing and it didn't go as seamlessly as I thought. Um, so it seems to have sometimes that you, you might notice like in my test here, and let me move it to the side, you might notice that I have some additional lines here, right? Well, because that's because if I remove those additional lines, uh, I get weird errors. Yeah. I'm not sure where that comes from. It sometimes seems to like get some issues with, um, some weird characters that sometimes creep in and it like, like kind of like chokes up on the characters. There's a lot of things that can go wrong with encoding and and special characters, invisible characters in text files. And it seems like it's not quite, not, not all of the bugs are ironed out just yet. So just keep that in mind that there, there, there might be some, some, some issues working with this. Generally, the version I'm working with currently is 0. 0.1.12c. And if there's any bugs that, that we're gonna, gonna get found in this revision, you know, we're gonna get C, D, E, and so forth. And you should always make sure that you have the newest version happening because quite often there's bugs that appear. Right, so that was about include. A lot of people were waiting for include and I'm glad that, that we have now this option here as well. Now let us move on to some um, some additional functions, some additional functionality that we have now with Pico8 as well, uh, with the tool set. One thing that I kind of found fun is that um, you can, there was a function called um, cursor. Let me show you real quick. So something like this, you know, it looks like we print some text on the screen and you can see we're using the function cursor and the function color. The function cursor sets the text cursor where text will appear next at a given position. And then, you know, you can start printing there at this position. The text color sets the color of the text or um, anything else to a certain color. Uh, something you can do now is you can roll cursor and color into one thing. If we just uh, supply 
the 11 here as the third parameter. So now you can like do it in one line. Save the virtual tokens if you work with these two functions a lot. I kind of like thought it was like a neat way of ironing things out. But something that I find more interesting is that we have um, a new way of, or a slightly upgraded way in which a line drawing works. So let me show you real quick how that works. <laughs> Okay, so um, when you are drawing a line, when you are drawing a line, right? So you would specify the starting coordinates and the or, uh, end coordinates. So there's like four numbers that we will specify. Starting coordinates, let's say zero, zero. End coordinates, let's say 64, 64. That should get us a line from the top left corner to the center of the screen, right? Like this, good. Something you can do now is you can leave out, you can just supply two numbers, just two numbers, just a, just like a set of coordinates, X and Y. And it will draw from the last position it draw the line to, to this coordinate. So it kind of, kind of continue, can continue drawing a line. And that's something that we're doing here when we're pressing a button, we're just drawing a line to a random location from the last position where we drawn a line to. So you can see we're drawing a line here and I can, <laughs> we're gonna get a star here, that's funny. If we leave this out if, or, or if we put this line in here in init function, you can see it draws a line to the center of the screen. Now when we press a button, it will draw from that position to a random position. And if you press a button, it will draw from that position to a new random position. And then from that position, a new random position and so forth. It's just like a new behavior of the way the line, um, the line function works. Nothing like revolutionary, but it might in some cases save you a bunch of tokens, make things more efficient. Um, there is like basically a program tracks somewhere in in the background, in the behind the scenes, it tracks somewhere the last coordinate to which a line was drawn and you can take advantage of that. Really cool, I like it. I'm pretty, I wonder if there's like some people who are working on like these polygon drawing functions that were posted around in BBS, if they can like somehow uh, make things faster or more efficient or the more you know token efficient. Looking forward to see what people will do with that. Now there's a new function here as well, which is maybe not quite as exciting. There's a bunch of new functions basically that are, that are in here. So let me see. So we have next, the function next, we have a raw set, we have a raw get, we have um, raw len and we have raw equal. These sound exciting and maybe they are, but I am not as, I'm, mm, I try to get behind what they're doing, but it's kind of like very like behind the scene kind of stuff that comes with Lua, with the programming Lua, programming language Lua, that Pico 8 didn't fully implement so far. Now it's fully implemented. So, you know, it's kind of filling in all the blanks that were there before. Um, I kind of like, maybe we'll go into details what next does, um, but before we do like raw set, row get, row len and row equal, Mm. So these kind of like deal with something called the meta table and you, there was actually some functions already that de dealt with the meta, meta table set meta table, right? Yeah. So you had like the option to change the meta tables. What are meta tables? Oh, um, mm. maybe there's some better people, people who are uh, more experienced with Lua in the comment section that can, can clear up what meta tables are. Basically, uh, when you are dealing with objects and uh, with um, variables, there's stuff happening automatically in, in the background and raw set, raw get and so forth lets you circumvent that, lets you kind of like um, edit the values without triggering some side effects and set meta table lets you modify those side effects to your advantage. Uh, I saw an example of somebody using like these kind of functions, for example, to disable um, the, that thing in Lua in the Pico 8 where you um, automatically define a variable when you assign it a value. So you would say something like uh, test equals Five and that creates a new variable called five. It, they, you, can, you can disable it. So if you go test minus five equals five, it actually doesn't do anything. It throws error. You have to, would have to say something like define test 
to define the variable test and then you can start using it. Some people prefer it this way because they don't want to accidentally with a typo create a bunch of variables and have like these very difficult to track down bugs. They want to make, make sure that all the variables that exist are the variables that they want to exist. And they would be able to create this behavior using these functions. Now, I wasn't able to make the sample code work in Pico 8, so I can't even demonstrate that. I would love it if somebody who's really experienced with Lua would able to um, show us like some practical examples of what you can do with those functions. But so far, I think it's safe to, um, if you're not into like those behind the scenes kind of stuff, it's safe to ignore them. I'm glad that just like there's like, you know, Pico 8 is getting closer to what um, the original Lua is because that's quite often where people who are struggling with Pico 8 kind of start looking for, they start looking for code that was written in different environments that use Lua and then they get frustrated because some things might not be fully implemented. So I'm glad these things like Lua in general and Pico 8 are coming closer together. This is good. Next is also kind of one of those functions, but maybe it's one function that might get actually uh, that we might get some use from. So let me uh, do a small setup to show you what it does. Okay, so I've created an, an array, a table, as we say in Lua, um, that has three entries: Frodo, Sam, and Legolas. Uh, the next function, what it can do, it, it can iterate through this um, through um, this table and give us the next entry. So let's say we go next party, just next party, and just like let's let's print this to the screen. It won't be very exciting. <laughs> I can already <laughs> spoil that. Let's do a CLS. It didn't, didn't actually print anything. Um, There we go. Okay, so um, this next function returns two values. So this is a bit confusing and there's more some stuff that we, I think we touched upon a little bit when we are talking about um, um, about multiple variables, I think in, in the roguelike tutorial, but um, just to, so, so you know what, what's, what this is about. So when you're defining variables, uh, when you're assigning variables, um, values to variables in Lua, you can assign values to multiple variable variables in the same in the same go um, by just separating with a comma. So you have i and v, and we can set it to one and two. So if you write like this, um, the one gets assigned to i and the two gets assigned to v, right? So if you print i and print v. We get one and two, okay? And so equally, functions can return more than just one v value. Um, the next function here returns two values. So uh, we need actually two variables to kind of like get, um, get all of the values that the function returns. So I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna go next party one. In this case, we're gonna get the first value that next returns into i and the second value that next returns into v. So now uh, if we call next party, just without anything, we're just gonna get one and Frodo. That's because Frodo, Frodo is in, um, assigned to index one. Something you can do here now is for example, is go next party one. So starting with index one, you ask what is the next uh, element in this table, in this list. This, in, th in this case, it should be Sam. So we should get uh, Sam and we should get the two, uh, the index two. And indeed it works. Now, why are we getting the two out of it? Well, because sometimes you have tables where certain indexes have no value assigned to them. So for example, when we have Frodo, we're gonna put in a little nil in between here. So location, so index number two, has nil assigned to it. And then index number three will have Sam now. So if you run this, you will get three Sam because then uh, this function will skip over entries that have nil assigned to them. And it will continue doing so until it reaches um, it reaches the final entry. So we get four, we're gonna get the nil out of it because this is the last entry. And so it will return nil uh, as an indicator that this was the last entry in this table. So with this next function, you can actually iterate 
through an array. And in fact, if you're going doing like the for all in all functions, these kind of like the constructs, these kind of loops, um, Behind the scene, Lua is always calling this next function. It's kind of weird that this next function wasn't implemented before in Pico 8, because it seems like such a fundamental aspect of, of how Lua works, but maybe it was implemented but not exposed to, the, to, the, to us as developers. Now we have this ability to, to find the next entry in a table starting from a certain position. Good. And this concludes the programming part. So now I wanted to talk about some maybe some exciting stuff. So for example, something that I, I was delighted to because it was the problem that I had recently was, have you ever been to Splore? Have you ever used one of these guys? This is a, a uh, oh my gosh, this is so bright. This is a game shell. And you will notice that the game shell doesn't have a keyboard. It has only keys. So if you ever go to a Splore, I was like, I got one of these and wanted to test some games on it. I was like, yes, finally, let's get let's get some games going. So you can like update, you know, the explorer is working, you can navigate explorer, it's great. You can see what the new games are happening. There's some really great games in here. But then I was like, okay, I want to play some of my old games when I, when I, uh, that I already uploaded. So I'm going to go, okay, let's go search. And then I was like, oh. There is no keyboard. I cannot type anything in here. I cannot search for anything because there is no keyboard associated with, with, this, with this device. You can attach a Bluetooth keyboard and that's what I eventually did, but it was like a very cumbersome process. Now, going up and down, you can actually, in Explore, uh, you can type in something using um, just a regular Pico 8 button, so up, down and so forth. Love it. I love it so much. This is this is a very fundamental thing and the very it, it, mm, it's safe. It's 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 good. I like it. I love it a, a lot. So let's see. Can we get a There we go. My chance sweet buns and it allows me to, to find this. something that is also possible here now is you can press enter. And then uh, it, there's a new function here in this menu called search Christman. So it's, you can search um, the creator of this card and see what other cards they uploaded, except from that. So if you do that, you will see all of my games here and you can see what kind of stuff I uploaded. There's some weird untitled stuff here that I'm not sure why it's there. Anyway, so there's some sample tutorial code and all of the games are uploaded here. So this is really nice that you can also look for authors. And then finally, something I also really enjoy is there's a kiosk mode. Let's imagine ourselves in the future we are famous Pico 8 developers. We've been invited by a trendy club who they want to make a video game exhibition about the cool independent kind of stuff and they heard about you. They want you to show up with your stuff and show off. You, have, you will have like a, you know, like a booth, you can put up your PC there and you can show off all your games, you can load up all your Pico games and you can show off your games to all of the Patreons there to the club and they will check out your amazing games. They really will love you. But alas, how are you going to show multiple games in Pico 8? Because then, you know, you set up your PC, you run Pico 8 and they can play. You get some drinks and when you returned, some guy who was drunk, who just mashed some keyboards, destroyed everything, like exited Pico 8, maybe uh, deleted the files from the PC or maybe started running different games on Pico 8, you know, had control over the PC that you didn't want them to have. Well, um, so you can now boot Pico 8 into this kind of kiosk mode that kind of restricts the kind of stuff that you can do with Pico 8. And you can do this by, um, pardon the, the fact that this is a German version, by uh, starting Pico 8 exe with minus kiosk uh, on, attached to the end of it. So if you run this, it will boot into a splore that only allows you to access uh, the favorites. I don't have actually any favorites in this version of, of the my Pico installation, so there is actually nothing that we can do here. But if I had some uh, games set as favorites, let me, let me, and you can see we can shut down Pico 8 still, but we cannot like edit the code or anything. So now if I launch my, now that I have some favorites, if I launch my um, Pico 8 with the kiosk mode, it, you can see all of the games that I favorited. In this case, it's gonna be all of the games I have mine. I, I created myself. So this is how you can use Pico 8 to, uh, to be kind of like this kind of arcade machine that where you can load multiple games on it.
cool stuff. Now, the final thing I want to discuss is also something that I've been looking forward to a lot, which is the new HTML5, uh, HTML5 template. Let me show you how things were. Look, this is not a game that I created. This is a game that one of my students created. You can play it. I think it's uploaded to the BBS. It should be. It, it doesn't matter. It's just like it's just like the one of the old templates, HTML5 templates that I had. If you export um, Pico 8 games to HTML5, you will create like an index HTML version of an um, in index HTML file that opens in a browser where you know your games is playing inside. And it would have like these kind of buttons at, at, the, at the bottom, very fundamental controls. Now there is a new template that will that looks like this. So this is from one of the games I made, this is Breakout Hero, and you can see it's a bit different. First of all, the buttons are here on the side. The buttons are here on the side here, and uh, there's also additional functions that weren't there previously. And also you see the behavior of the card itself is different. It kind of like scales with, uh, with the window, whereas before it did not scale. It just like ignored the size of the window. Now it adjusts the size of the window to a certain size. Uh, uh, beyond a certain size, it doesn't scale up anymore. So that's that's actually good. I t exported some of the games that I had previously on websites like Itch.io, and it looks really nice, really way bigger. And I, I should have done that myself previously. I should have just made the videos, the, the games bigger. So anyway, so this is really nice. And something that I also really appreciate with a new template is now this new button here. This new button shows up the uh, the controls, um, the control scheme, because I noticed that was uh, quite often the problem when with games that I, I exported and uploaded like itch.io people would play them and they would have no idea how to how to control them and they would like ran, write angry comments even though I had like the comments in the description of the of the game but people wouldn't bother to look for them they would be like I just press buttons didn't work <laughs> broken game lazy death <laughs> um, but now I think like having like this button here, like this little controller in the, in, the, in the corner might lead more people to be like, wait a minute, maybe this is controlled differently. Maybe this is not something that you control with your mouse. Maybe I have to actually press some buttons. And in fact, in, in this menu, if you, when you press buttons, you will see that things are happening. Something that's weird, by the way, is that, so each button is, uh, so we have like, wait, so so C, uh, so the, um, the circle button, that's C, uh, Z, but also N, but N is not listed as one of the options here. So it actually misses some of the button layouts. So maybe we should add them as well, or maybe I'm not sure why M and N are here. But anyways, yeah, so you can like see the buttons when you, as you press them, so you can you, you can test them out and you see if they're working. You can see if joysticks were detected. That's also something that new, like if you have the gamepads installed, they will also, I think, work here in, in the browser as well. Uh, something I would love to have is an opportunity to remap controls here in this menu. Uh, and I think that is something that, that is, has been said that is, comes up later. Also important, the pause button actually pauses the actual game. Previously, it is just like did nothing, like nothing happened. But it actually um, brings up the pause menu, which allows you to like reset the cart and stuff like that. I think you can customize this menu from within Pico 8 as well. So you have more options here as well. That's great. And of course, you can turn on music on and off, and you can uh, set everything to full screen. Something that has been removed is this cards button, which allowed you to pull up. Uh, it was actually a link to the Alexa Lawful forums. Uh, so apparently it was removed, so I'm, I'm fine with that. Now, the cool thing, the reason why I'm really excited about this template is that um, Zap has been working on uh, native or like like this template includes a mobile version as well. So if you pull up this one, and now I will hopefully show some footage. If you show uh, open this file on a cell phone, uh, then it should um, show the game, but also it should show some on-screen controls, allowing you to play those Pico 8 games on mobiles as well. If you pull them up in a in a browser. Uh, this is great and I've been experimenting with like these these versions of these kind of like templates were floating around previously is I'm glad that now we have like an official version of these um, however I've experienced some issues um, not necessarily with a with a fundamental basic um, version of it but if uh, I uploaded um, this template to a website like itch.io 
that website would then mess around with the HTML, with the website, shift things around. So things wouldn't work perfectly anymore. So um, the button presses on the screen wouldn't perfectly align to where the buttons appear on the on-screen controls. And also it was very slow. It wouldn't run on my, my cell phone at all. Although I have to say, I have a very, very old cell phone. So that doesn't have to mean anything. But anyways, um, I would consider the mobile controls as something that's more experimental, something I wouldn't completely rely, rely on, but it's worth experimenting with. I think this is a good sign of the things to come. All right, so this is basically most of the stuff. So I've been talking about this guy. Um, something that's also worth noting is um, there's also this guy. That's a Pico, that's a, um, that's a pocket chip. I love it so much. It's no longer available, but it's the thing that started my, my journey with Pico 8. And something that I found really cool is that um, Zep also released an update for Pico 8 for the pocket chip. The pocket chip is no longer available as a, as a thing to develop on. You cannot buy it anymore, <laughs> or at least not in the, from, from the creators. But um, Zep is still continuing supporting the, the software of it, so you can get the newest Pico version on the pocket chip as well. <sighs> Thank you so much, Zep. That's I'm really glad about this. I was getting nervous that we, we might we might get stuck on an old version on the Pico chip, uh, not a pocket chip. So that's really great. And um, how you upgrade your pocket chip is also in the in, in the thread. I'm gonna post the thread here on in the comment in doobly doo downstairs, so you can check it out immediately. Um, there's some more stuff. I haven't covered all of the things that, that are in here. That's something that you um, that you can explore yourself a little bit. There's some more stuff you can now. There's an option to paste music in the Lexalophil forums. That's something that you can do now. There's um, undo levels have been fixed. There's some general bug fixes. There is some breakage warning that um, the way the time function, the time function here, the way that works has been changed, has been basically fixed. And the way it was previously was kind of broken when you were working with 60 frames per second and certain programs relied on that and uh, those programs are now a bit broken. So, you know, the, the small details that like that, but I'm not gonna, there's some, um, you can also export now your cards to Raspberry um, and you can also address serial connections with Raspberry. I'm not really into these topics myself. Um, so that's why I wasn't really discussing them here right now. There's been also some fixing with um, with CPU costs. There previously there was like this pairs function that was a lot faster than all or for each, but now all of these are working at the same speed. And also there's some discussion about how scaling works. That um, now the the way Pico 8 scales the image, especially on the low low resolution displays, is um, more refined and you should get better results. Um, I've been working with this guy here with a, with a um, game shell. It has a low resolution display. I haven't seen any difference, but I wasn't expecting a big difference on that one. Um, due to the details of how this works, you have to dig a little bit yourself maybe into this to understand what is being done here. Something, the final thing that I found very exciting here is the road ahead section here, where Zep is describing what he wants to get done before he moves Pico 8 from the alpha version to the beta version where he considers everything to be in place. And that thing is an online scorekeeping function. So apparently he wants to add some functionality to, um, whoops, to um, uh, save information on the internet and retrieve information from the internet from within Pico 8 automatically somehow. Uh, he has like a lot of things He's working, there's a lot of things, infrastructure that has been done, uh, has been set up in, in order for this to work first. Uh, so that's something that he uh, can preserve for next version. I guess it's gonna be 0 0.1.13. Um, and of course, everybody's excited about this function because potentially saving something on their internet, maybe there was potential to somehow leverage it to make multiplayer games going, like online multiplayer games going. Uh, obviously, probably not like massive online multiplayer, you know, or RPG kind of stuff, but maybe like some simple, you know, interaction between users would be very exciting. All right, so this is it for um, version 0 0.1.12. If there's anything I missed that you really like, you should post it in the comment section. If there's any feature that you're really excited about, if there's something good wrong, post it in the comment section, definitely. 
you know, I'm just like going through the, through the through the stuff myself, especially if you have something to add about the new Lua function that were posted. I'm intrigued by those, to be honest, but I still want to see kind of like some um, some um, some professional person uh, dealing with them. If you, by the way, these are like the mobile controls I was talking about. If you have any solutions or experience with the mobile controls on how to get those working cleanly in uh, an uh, itch.io then definitely let me know because that's something i i noticed a lot of people were discussing that that uh, in itch.io or other websites generally like huge percentage of your traffic comes from mobile browsers so making pico 8 work on those devices is mm, a really high priority for me so anyways that is it for this video and finally i also wanted to mention one more thing so i haven't been posting in a while i have to make a, at least one month break that's because i had some offspring that i that appeared from nowhere they had to deal with now uh, my life has, has been turned upside down after like reconstruct my work schedule i'm working it i won't be probably able to post uh, on a regular basis the way I was um, able to post previously you know that's kind of like part of the course when you're getting when you're getting offspring um, but yeah I will try to do at least you know one video every now and then uh, try to get back on the horse so to speak um, I noticed something very exciting and that's the fact that uh, we've reached 1000 subscribers thank you so much guys I was that was like a huge milestone for me I was really excited when I saw that one uh, so yeah thanks for subscribing I guess and uh, I have to now figure out what the next milestone is going to be. So I guess like the next milestone is going to be 1,500. I don't know. So yeah, belated. Thank you for joining me. Thank you for subscribing to this channel. Um, yeah, it was really exciting for me. So anyways, uh, see you on next ep episode. See you on next video. I'm not sure what we're going to talk about. There's some new developments that were excited that were exciting. I saw some CRT filters. Um, maybe we're gonna. There's going to be some more discussion of this new app, new function that are available here. Not quite sure. Um, oh, and of course, I also also have to um, clarify what will happen with Porklike because I've been working this roguelike tutorial, and I want to, of course, finish my version of the roguelike and make it level for people to play. I'm still working on it. Obviously, the development of it has been a bit postponed due to the offspring situation, um, but I'm hopefully now this video can like gets me started again in my regular work schedule or semi-regular work schedule, and I, I can get it finished. Um, I've changed the course a little bit. It will be a very different game from the one. I, we did together in the um, in the tutorial, but it might be a very different game. But uh, you know, I think the, like making a little detour, experimenting with the gameplay stuff, is is going to be worth it. So look forward to that one. Not tomorrow. So enough blabbering. See you next time, guys. Bye bye.